going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll just dive in this evening, okay? Father, I come to you right now thanking you for who you designed us to be and how you have uh, sought to, to govern us and teach us to, to love your law. Thank you for this uh, nation that we happen to be citizens of. Uh, thank you for the blessings that we find in this country. Father, I pray that, uh, that we will be good citizens first of your kingdom and that we might uh, also be uh, adequate citizens uh, in this country. Uh, thank you for those who've gone before us, who uh, have guided us, help us to steward these manifold graces that you've given us. And uh, in all things, we want to bring glory to your name, and it's through Christ I pray. Amen. Alrighty, we'll uh, dive in on session three here this evening, and we're going to strive to uh, cover the topic or the subject matter of uh, all men are created equal. As a matter of fact, uh, there, the Declaration of Independence has something to say that you can't really you can't find anywhere else, even in ancient documents. It says that. All men are created equal. Of course, uh, in the eyes of God, you know, there's neither free nor slave. There's neither bond or, or servant. There's neither Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ. However, in the, there's a dichotomy going on. We still remain who we are. It, it's, it's a pretty amazing fact. Uh, those that designed this statement to the King of England uh, made a, an obvious statement statement that uh, has reverberated uh, throughout the course of history. Just a little freebie here, just to remind you, Noel Webster's not a signer of the Declaration, not a signer of the Constitution. He's still considered a founding father. Uh, Noel Webster, uh, born 1758, Died in 1740 or 1840-something, I believe, 42. I, I can't remember. It just escapes me. Um, what's Noah Webster known for? Anyone? Dictionary. Okay, yeah, the dictionary. What else is he known for? Uh, big words. <laughs> yeah. He, he, uh, he standardized education in, in the United States. Uh, for a long period of time, even after the Revolution, we were getting a lot of our school books from England. And uh, so, uh, you've heard of the McGuffey Reader? Uh, his, uh, his primers, what they were called then, were used in American education for over 100 years. Uh, and uh, some of those lessons in there are, are pretty substantial. He says this, he said, No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. Now that is true whether you hold to biblical Christianity or not. It's for all people. Not just for, quote, Christian people, but for all people. The principle... The, the, the outline works for all. All right? Now, <clears throat> of course, right there at the preamble of the Declaration of what we call the Declaration of Independence, is that statement that all men are created equal. All right? Now, you're hearing another E word being tossed around a lot these days. Uh, you hear equality, you also hear another E word, and that is equity, right? Don't get those two mixed up. Equity is something that, for example, how many of you own your own house? You can build equity in your house, right? And who does that equity belong to? You as the individual, because you have laid it up, all right? Equality, on the other hand, is for everyone. 
Now, equality is one of those matters that uh, is, is not really a, a, an elaborate concept. It's pretty straightforward and to the point. The text says that all men are created equal, yet we obviously look different, right? We obviously are different. For example, you can have someone who is what? In this picture, it's a comparison of what? Someone who is taller and someone who is not as tall or short, right? So we have guys like me with no hair, and then we have throwbacks. We have guys with all kind of hair, right? This doesn't seem fair, right? But uh, so, <clears throat> again, we are created equal, yet obviously different. All right, just just on the surface, when you just look at that picture with, with all the different ethnic res representation representation there, what does that tell you about your Creator? When you look at that picture, what is it, what comes to mind when you think about your Creator? Huh? Free will. Free will? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I mean. It's, how many of y'all have all kinds of different flowers in your flower beds, right? Why? Because each of them have their own beauty, their own, their own significance, their own dignity, all right? So out of, from Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, this is what we get. After the flood, this is what we get. We get a great amalgamation of all kinds of colors and shapes and sizes for what one purpose? To bring glory to God. You see, Jesus said the lilies don't even think about it. They don't, they don't argue. They don't fuss and, and fume. They just naturally give glory to God with their aroma and their beauty. Right? The birds of the air, do they, do they fret? about bringing glory to God? No, they just do it naturally. However, you and I are created a little differently. We get the opportunity, as Don said, we get the opportunity to choose whether we're going to glorify God or not. And then when you get a group of people from various backgrounds, various ethnic backgrounds, by the way, there's only one race. It's called the human race. There's all kinds of ethnic diversity, but there's only one race, all right? Uh, I remember when Merle was going through his, uh, one of his uh, T-cell therapies several years back, uh, they had to go all the way to eastern Germany to find someone that would, be, would match him. I think it's because no one else would get along with him here but uh, he had to go all the way to eastern Germany, and that person had, had Prussian background and Mongolian background. I mean, they did everything where that person had come from, and somehow or other, those two were a match. Is that by happenstance, or is that by design? It's by design. All right, so, I don't know about you, I love football. Even though everyone is created equal in sports, where we keep score, all right, where we keep score and it really matters, we find out relentlessly who's equal and who's less than, all right? And one of my favorite scores is this score right here. This is from 2019 when I see that 56 to 27, or if I see it from 2018, the 63 to 39 makes me smile a lot, particularly with some of my uh, friends like Troy Northrup who likes that other team. So we find out pretty quick who's equal and who's not up to the task. But we're all equal. Everyone has the opportunity to compete. You will succeed more than others succeed. All right? I mean, in this game in particular, I say it succeeded in putting more points on the board than that team up north did, although they put some points on the board. So we determine winners and losers by scores. 
even though we are still equal. So let me ask you, when you think about equality, what then does equality mean? When you think about that. Equality. To be equal. What comes to mind? Same rights. Same rights. Okay. Okay. All right. We have the same rights. Same, I'm sorry. Opportunity. Okay. All right. And what is the ceiling or the floor for that opportunity? Well, the ceiling is you can rise to the level of your ability and your competency, right? There are some people you don't, do not want to drive a school bus, right? Some people are not competent, even though they may want to drive a school bus. If they're not competent, do you want them driving your children or grandchildren? No. Uh, not everyone is competent to be in a neurosurgeon or a rocket scientist, or whatever the case might be. So when we talk about equality, we're talking about <clears throat> equal opportunities at the start, right? Not at the finish. Not at the finish line. That's, any of y'all remember outcome-based education back in the 90s? That was a big thing back in the 90s. Where, and you probably ran across some of that. So in what way or respect is it true that all men are created equal? Okay, if we're created in God's image, what does that say about us? You inherently have something. What is it? I'm sorry? A soul. A soul, yes. And that soul is dignified by what? The breath of life that God has given given to you. All right? So, what we're talking about, in what respect or is it true that all men are created equal? And by the way, when I use the term men, I mean the male man and the female man. All right? The only difference between a man and a woe man, man is man, and woe man is a man with a womb. That's what it means. All right, so I'm just using those terms uh, interchangeably. All right, so when we look at that group, I mean, we've got, how would you characterize that group? Do you see one in there that's younger? Do you see one in there that's older? Do you see uh, various uh, ethnic representations in that picture? Uh, who would say in the room that that picture is still a, really a very attractive picture? I mean, you're drawn to it, right? They seem, uh, seem alive and alert, and, and they're just, just full of life, all right? So you got moms and dads, you got kids, you got grandmas, grandpas, perhaps some, either, some of y'all that are great-grandparents are in there as well. So, uh, where then, that's what we're talking about at this point, where does personal and individual dignity come from? Well, we, we've hit on that just for a second. Personal and, and, and individual dignity comes from God Himself. He's the one who designed us. He's the one who's thought us up. Um, how does Psalm, the psalmist characterize that in Psalm 139? Where did God see me? When I was being... Knitted together, where? In my mother's womb. At that point, who has dignity? I do. At that point, who am I? Well, I'm me. And you're you. At that point, there's dignity. Now, when God says there's dignity, and by that, God says there's value, there's uniqueness. Because who has your thumbprint? You and you alone. Even the shapes of your eyes and the location of the ears on the side of your head and the shape of your feet 
Uh, I watched I watched Wyatt Haynes walk in to the auditorium this morning. Well, actually, I heard him first, and I thought, oh, I need to ask Thad a question. I looked up. It was not Thad. It was Wyatt walking. So I'm not going to tell Wyatt that he walks like he's dead until later and I can get some, some, some use out of it. But I thought, oh, there's Thad on it because he has a unique footfall. If, if you were to come into this building three days in a row and I hear your feet, I can pick it up pretty quick. I know when Bill Taylor's coming in. I used to know when, when uh, uh, Dean Minks would walk in. I, I know, know your footfalls. There's a couple of you girls that walk super heavy. I think you're mad when you walk in. All right? You have personal and individual dignity. Now, what is the first principle of dignity? It's to be respected. Why? Because the image of God is stamped on that. Uh, dare we go back and rehearse the Ten Commandments? Why, why should I not steal from you? Why should I not covet your stuff? Why should I, 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 I not uh, tell you lies? Well, because I harm the image that's on you. And if something is dignified, we uphold it. Okay? So when they write, all men are cre cre created. <laughs> all men are created equal. I'm saying all men are created with a God-given dignity. Does anyone have the right to abuse that dignity? No. That's the statement that they make when they start laying out the case. Here's what here's and here's what's going on. You've closed down legislatures. You, we've got kangaroo courts. Uh, you're burning our villages and our coasts. You're ravaging our people. You're pressing them into service. You're just abusing us. And it cannot and will not be uh, uh, tolerated. All right. So, true or false? All six of those people have equal dignity in the eyes of God. I know what I want to say. But just by based based on creation, based on their conception and birth, do all those six people have equal dignity? Answer is yes. From Mao to Hitler to uh, Castro, Churchill, Lincoln, and Franklin, they all have equal dignity. Now, each of them wrote their own stories. Each of them made their own choices and their own agreements. And I'm not going into detail about Castro or Mao or, or Franklin as far as that goes, but I just, just wanted to show you. Each person represented there has dignity. Some of those pictures, and I'm going to get off of those pretty quick because I'm going to, we're going to do something that I think is fun. Um, <clears throat> you have someone in your world that you have a negative response to right now as far as whether they have dignity or not. Uh, I want you to wrestle with that. Some of these people have made some bad agreements and they're putting their life in the ditch kind of like Mao and Hitler have. Uh, don't forget, as long as they have breath in their lungs, there is hope that that dignity can be restored. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Uh huh. They would have looked at him and said, "No way." Yeah. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Particularly if you're a Jew, right? Is that? Yeah. yeah. He's he's a turncoat. He he forsook us. And the, yeah. So don't underestimate the value of personal dignity. All right. 
Because <laughs> sometimes we like to idealize uh, that period of time leading up to the revolution and lionize people like, you know, Sam Adams, quite the colorful character, or John Adams, or Hancock, or any of those, any of those people. We, we want to lionize them like, you know, they are super people. They're just common, ordinary people, full of flaws. Very flawed people, as far as character is concerned, but uh, principled, principled nonetheless. All right, so. Um, everyone here has either raised children or been around children or are raising children, right? So let's do a little exercise. Two of my favorite things in the world are little children and beagle puppies. Okay? Anybody like beagle pups? There's nothing cuter than a beagle pup. All right? Now, <clears throat> to some degrees, raising children and raising dogs are very similar, up to a point. All right? Any of y'all have pets at home? All right? Excluding cats. Cats are not pets. <laughs> Sorry, Carol, I had to throw that out there because I know you just love everything. Do you still have your turkey? Oh, I'm so sorry. Huh? I reckon. Last time I saw him, he was 492 pounds. Is that about how big he was when you buried him? <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, children will do something that puppies will never, ever do. Now, Sometimes puppies are preferable to children, all right? Sometimes. However, children are, are quite uh, exquisite. And um, that kid right there is going to do something that these puppies will never, ever do. However, there is one exception. At our house, uh, I speak for all of our dogs. Our dogs have different personalities. I don't know if that's their personality or not, but it's one I've assigned to them. And they all have different, different verbiage, and they talk in different ways. And sometimes I can get Trace to talk back to me through. We have a little fun doing that. So uh, I've got uh, uh, Laddie and Dewey and Lucy and, and Pokey and JoJo and Daisy and uh, also Porkchop. No, she's also known as Portia. I call her Porkchop because she likes to eat like me. So, so we all have conversations on a frequent basis. But actually, do dogs ever talk? Nah, they really can't verbalize like we verbalize. But this baby, you give a kid a year and a half or so, and what do they start doing? They start mimicking what you say. That's what dignifies us as different from any other animal. We are unlike any other part of creation because <clears throat> in that child is not only the ability to speak, but the ability to what? Think. Because when we're speaking, what are we actually doing? We're thinking out loud, right? And when we're thinking, we're talking to ourselves silently, right? No other creature has the ability to do that. So when the, when the signers of the Declaration of Independence speak about us as all men are created equal, we have the ability to reason, to think, not just to feel. Now, dogs, of course, they'll speak in their pleasure and their pain. I mean, Portia, every time we go home, she's all the time moaning. I call her Mona, moaning Lisa sometimes. Because she moans, I've missed you, I've missed you, I've missed you. Where have you been? And look at my duck, it is, it's, I need a new one. You know, those are things I'm saying, of course. So, what is it that separates human beings from beagle pups? Well, it's the ability to speak. The ability to articulate thought the ability to be able to reason between 
left and right, up and down, in and out, right and wrong, just and unjust, and give verbiage to it. Right? That's the difference between. So when we read all men are created equal, saying that we are a different type of creature than any other creature and ought to be respected at a higher level. You don't treat people like a dog. You treat people like human beings, like those who have the image of God imprinted on their soul. Because when God created us, we didn't just become a body that was alive. We became a living soul. And our bodies is only a third of who we really are. And our bodies, <clears throat> these ones, are going to wear out. They're going to fail us at some point, and we're going to bury them, every one of them. Now, we're promised a new body like unto Christ's body, his glorified body, <coughs> Excuse me, which is going to be pretty cool. We don't know what that's like yet, but it's going to be pretty neat. Can you imagine walking through a wall and then be able to sit down and eat? That's crazy. Uh, can you imagine being in one place and then all of a sudden find yourself someplace? Wouldn't that be cool just to transport yourself? Especially with all you know, these electric cars and stuff that's coming down the pike. Uh, Aristotle, in his works, The Politics, uh, says this in his comparison because Aristotle says that what separates us as human from all the other creatures is our ability to to speak. He says, man alone of the animals possesses speech. The mere voice, it is true, can indicate pain and pleasure, speaking of animals, and therefore is possessed by other animals as well. But speech is designed to indicate the, uh, the advantageous and the harmful. It's to be able to recognize that which is good and that which is evil. That which is right, that which is wrong. Uh, and therefore, also the right and the wrong. For it is the special property of man in distinction from the other animals that he alone has perception of good and bad and right and wrong and all other moral uh, qualities. That's what he says. So, when you get to the Declaration of Independence, what we have in the Declaration of Independence is a statement of that which is just and that which is unjust. Okay? That which is wrong and that which is correct. That which is an abuse and that which is an honor or a respect. It's really what we're looking at when we're looking at the Declaration of Independence. It, there is no political document like uh, this document. All right? Questions, thoughts at this point? All right, I'm going to move on. So, all men are created equal, therefore means we are born human. Hello, Captain Obvious. I mean, can we not all see that? So what does that mean as far as the value of that human life? Does it matter what your position or station is? Nope. This is what they're driving at. It does not matter what your position or what your station is. As a matter of fact, they are saying to the king of England, even though you may ride in a gold gilded carriage that is harnessed by horses, when you were a baby, you were very similar to me. And just because of, quote, royal birth that gives you no right to abuse, harm, or neglect another human being. And that's precisely what they're saying. You have neglected us. You have abused us. 
You are harming us. Now, how many of you would stay in a relationship if someone harms you, abuses you, or neglects you? Is that not crazy? I'm sorry? It happens frequently. That's why we have ministries and outreaches. And, 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 but you see what I'm driving at. Whoever, the abuser, the neglector, or the harmer has no right to do that. Why? Because all of us are created equal in the eyes of our Creator. All right? Do, do you see the wisdom in what these men are writing? That is just solid. And there's great principles for us to follow too in how we treat one another. As Paul would say, we ought to think more soberly. We ought to think less of ourselves and more of others. We ought to put others before ourselves. See, those are just biblical principles. So the king, <clears throat> he can ride in, uh, in this golden carriage. And when he comes, to, comes down the road, you all have seen presidential motorcades, right, where they just clear the paths. When he comes down the road, everyone snaps and salutes. And everyone is afraid of this guy because he has ultimate power over them. Well, we, just, we learned last time we were together, the ultimate authority is not him, but is the creator of the universe. And he's accountable to him uh, as, as well. So, just because you ride in that carriage does not make you greater than we. We are people too. Because all men are created equal. Now, when you look at that picture, what do you see? It's only two-dimensional, I get it. But what's that? That's a dairy cow, right? It's an old Holstein, right? All right? What's a cow say? Moo, right? Remember when we were... Jacob, do you know what that cow says? <laughs> okay. Cow says moo. We take our children, our grandchildren. Remember those twists and turns? We used to pull it. And you say, what, what is that? And they say, cow. And then you say, what's a cow say? And they would moo like a cow right and you'd pull the string and sure enough you're right it moo like a cow all right what's what's that a picture of it's a horse of course don't make me sing the mr ed song all right that's a horse of course everybody knows knows it's a, that's not a duck that's a horse right so we are taught that from the time we can we know our own name we're taught that and likewise uh that's my sister's graduation picture no that's a that, that's a pig, right? That's a pig. And everyone knows a pig, right? So uh, Mr. Haney, the honorary mayor of Cannesburg, Kentucky, would always say this because sometimes I'd get a little irritated with people and he'd say, come here, boy, I want to tell you something. And he always carried a shillelagh with him and he held court in Fraser's General Store. That's where the town office was. And around a pot belly stove and he said, look, son, if something has four legs, a little swishy tail, floppy ears, and he hauls a lot, it's probably a donkey. It's okay just to let it know what it is. Let it be what it is. So, from the time of our birth, it's rehearsed to us what these things are. Will that ever change? Will a cow ever become a horse, or a horse a pig, or a pig a cow? No, because it is what it is. So there's all kinds of things that, that come into play, whether it's language or thoughts or emotions or actions that we begin rehearsing. How many of, you, how many of your parents ever told you, if you see something that doesn't belong to you, leave it alone because it belongs to someone else, right? Who has ever walked the walk of shame because you took something that you shouldn't have? And your parents walked you in there and you had to give the speech and give it back to them and then pay them for it and then walk away from it. I have. 
I've, I've, I've done the walk of shame, and it's like, why did I have to pay for it twice? You know, but that was the lesson that, that uh, I stole a Barlow knife one time, is what I stole. And uh, I'll never own one ever again. Uh, because it owned me. All right. Thomas Jefferson, in, one, in basically his last letter, if you'll look at the date there, you see June 26, 1826. Uh, June 4, 1826 is when Thomas Jefferson dies. July, excuse me, July 4th, thank you, that is correct. July 4th, 1826 is when he dies, on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Mr. Uh, Waitman, no can of mine, but Mr. Waitman uh, writes uh, Jefferson inviting him to dig, to come to Washington City for the grand 50th celebration of the Declaration of Independence. The, the whole letter is worth a read if you take time to read it. Um, you could, I even found it on the Google box. Imagine that. Just uh, type in something like uh, Jefferson to Waitman or Jefferson's last letter. So, <clears throat> he, uh, Jefferson has this to say. He says, the palpable truth that the masses of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. What's Jefferson saying there? The masses of mankind have not been born with saddles on their backs. You want to take a stab at that? We're all equal. We all have dignity. That's right. All right? I love the way Jefferson writes. So, once, once what I'm saying is this. Once the ground is laid, all men are equal, this is the result. Just because somebody's born of noble birth does not give them the right to put a saddle on my back and spurs in my ribs. What does that do? Does that not demean the dignity of that human? Is that human a horse? No. What will that human being always be? Human. Now there are occasions when we don't rise to the level of humanity because we can be very inhumane. Uh, have you ever had selfish episodes? Do you ever find yourself becoming self-absorbed? Anyone other than me? Am I the only one? <laughs> All right. We, we have those tendencies because of our fallen nature. All right? Don't believe me? Just go to the grocery store and be three deep in a line and watch how everyone scatters when the other girl says, aisle four is going to open. You know, there could be a, there could be a, a wrestling match that takes place right there in the, in the aisle with people tripping over others to get to get out. So what Jefferson is saying here is we are all equal in the eyes of God, and therefore, if we're equal in the eyes of God, then how should we look at one another from the same perspective? Now again, remember, when we're looking at these documents, these, these are the ideal. Remember last week I said Scripture spells that out too, shows us the ideal and we should love one another and bear one another's and, and look out for the interests of others. And, and all those one another statements that sometimes we fail at. And then there's letters that, that, that Paul and Peter and John write to the churches. Uh, for example, at Corinth, you remember at Corinth, you got rich folks and poor folks in the church. And what are the rich folk doing to the poor folk in church? They're overlooking them, right? The rich folks bring food to eat, and they won't share with the poor folk in church. And what Paul says, you know, if you're going to... And then, of course, some of our brothers and sisters say, well, that's why we don't have a kitchen in our church. It's because of that. And then it creates a whole other order of legalistic problems for us. Have you ever been to a church that didn't have 
Sunday school, no kitchen in it. How about those who uh, are one cuppers? How about those that are one cuppers, wine only? We, there's non instrumental churches that do that. Uh, how about those that are one cuppers, wine only, take communion in an upper room? My question is do they sing a hymn, walk to Gethsemane and back, or to the Mount of Olives and back? Because it's, if you're going to follow the Bible, it's really, you're going to have to do that. Uh, Martha, you being a grad of Harding, you've probably run across some of those folks. But maybe not. Uh, anyway, so, the king rides in a carriage like that. The only way, <clears throat> the only legitimate way For you and I to be attached to that carriage is by what? I heard it. What'd you say? For me to be attached to that yep. Invitation. Okay. An agreement. You must consent. All right. Beautiful thing about the way our republic is set up, and we'll talk about this next time we get together. The the idea of consent which I think has been kind of whitewashed a little bit uh, or blurred. If that person volunteers, okay, you can put that on my back. But we're saying no. No, you, don't, you can't. You're not allowed to put that on my back. So the king can rightly put a harness on the horses that pull his carriage, but he can't do that to people unless they volunteer. Why? We are all created equal. We all have individual and personal uh, dignity. And that's why when they sign that document, it's not just one signature on there, but there's 50 some odd signatures on that document. And they're each pledging their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to this declaration. This is the way it is. This is what we all say from the northernmost part of, the, of, of America, or what England would call the colonies, to the southernmost tip. We're all in agreement that we have uh, individual <clears throat> dignity and uh, as well as a whole. So all men are created equal. Uh, that is the greatest uh, authority all men are created equal is the ultimate source of human freedom. And that's true for those of you that are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, what can you do? Huh? I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, right? You're free to go do whatever you want. Don't forget to stop and read Galatians 5.13 before you carry on. We shouldn't use our freedom to indulge whom? Ourself. But to serve one another. So it's a matter of harnessing. If we want to harness anything, we need to harness our fallen and broken appetites. So I'm not going to harm you because you're unique in, in the eyes of God. You have His uh, image on, uh, imprinted upon you. And so, uh, because of the ultimate authority, i.e., our creation, all right, because of the ultimate authority being created in the image of God, we've been given the ultimate source of freedom, and that is that you are created unique and as an individual. All men are created equal, whether that's the woman or the male man. They're all created equal and have certain inalienable rights that must not be trampled on. All right? Questions, observations? All right. What we'll do next time together is uh, we'll, we'll look at a an only, uh, and that is... Uh, that we are governed by consent and consent only. We'll just kind of 
dive into what consent is, what consent isn't, and what it means to be governed, the willingness to acquiesce, the willingness to, to accept boundaries, appropriate boundaries. Are boundaries acceptable? Well, I'd hope so, because what a boundary is is where I end and where you begin. Otherwise, we become trespassers. And trespassers uh, become wicked, crooked, and, and will commit all kinds of atrocities, which, again, we'll, we'll spell out as we look at uh, this document further. I, again, I appreciate your time. I know it's a, a precious commodity, and uh, thank you for spending a little bit with us here this evening. And uh, we'll stop there uh, with a word of prayer. William J., would you care to close us out with a word of prayer? I thank you. Does it? No way. Oh, I guess it is laying down under.